OK, so recording has started now. As usual, these lectures will be available later on, uh, later on this week, hopefully. Today, what I want to talk about is uh, some more about risk. Because we spoke about it last week. And there are things that follow on from where we got to last week and, and other aspects I want you to think about. Because we spoke last week about risk and the fact that risk is just part of life. Whether you're in an organisation or on your own. So we talked about identifying risk, figuring out what the risks were, and then different ways to manage them. Do we accept them? Do we lay them off to someone else? Do we do whatever? So I want to continue on that theme today and talk a wee bit more about identifying the risks. And I'll do that a lot faster once I have finally remembered to stop my phone. My phone is bringing. Apologies for that. There we go. So we talked about identifying, we talked about managing them, we talked about um, what they might be, what um, specific effects that a risk might have on the organisation, what the potential outcomes could be and any plans in place either to stop the risk happening or to minimise it if it does. And we looked at some, uh, quite a few actually, different uh, risk registers that, that actually made that kind of information explicit. And that's the sort of risk register that I'm expecting to see in your report. And that was part of the reason why I gave you the assignment last week to get you to start thinking about it. You'll also remember last week that uh, we started talking about it in terms of road traffic accidents, risks that we all take simply crossing the road. And we looked at different uh, approaches to avoid it or educate. A road traffic accident in this sense would come under the heading of operational risk, which is to say, if we did the avoidance bit, if we stayed in bed, we couldn't do what we need to do. You guys are cybersecurity students. There is a risk that your network connection could be attacked. Now, you could avoid that risk. You could avoid that risk quite easily with a hatchet taken to the main network line. But it would be kind of difficult for whichever organisation you were with to continue on their work. So you wouldn't. You would take one of the other approaches. So sometimes in organisations, you have organisational risks, things that happen because of the type of work that you do. And I've identified five different types of organisational risk here. Five headings, if you like. Now, they are not, as usual, comprehensive. They are not prescriptive. They are simply five headings where that I have found common to many organisations. So what I want to do is talk about those types. But please, please, when you're thinking about it, don't think, oh, it doesn't come under any of these headings, it doesn't belong, or it doesn't come under any of these headings, therefore it's not a risk. These are example headings. They are decent examples and they are examples that every organisation should certainly look at. 
but there are others. So I'm going to look at each of these. We'll try and figure out what we mean by these type of risk, and we'll look at an example of where that might come into play. The first one uh, that can be an issue is strategic risk. You as a person, the organisation that you work for, everyone makes plans. You guys are planning to get your degree and possibly look for a job as a, a cyber security expert with us with a sideline in governance risk and compliance. That might be your plan. But plans don't always work out. You might get to the end of this year, get your degree and decide, do you know something? We've been locked down for three years. I'm going to travel the world for a year. Plans to change. And that's fine because you want plans to change. You want to continually examine the plans you've made and figure out whether they are still your priorities. The issue for an organisation comes where the changes are made not of your own volition. So changes that happen either inside your organisation, someone in a key uh, role may leave and you start to realise that you don't have access to their skill base. How do you then replace that? External things can impact it. You made a, a strategic decision to grow sales throughout the European Union and you suddenly find that it's next to impossible to do that because the cost of um, the cost of administration and, and doing all the forms to sell into Europe has suddenly shot up. So internal or external changes can and do impact plans all the time. So what you need to do is change. Change what you are doing. Look at the plans that you have, figure out whether those plans are still reasonable, and then decide whether or not you want to continue that plan, modify it, or do whatever. The point is, you've made it a conscious decision, not a, a reaction to something that's happened. Now, organisations do this all the time. Here's an example of something called a Boston box. And it's designed to let organisations examine their current portfolio of products to decide whether or not the products are worth persevering with. So it puts them into four boxes. Now there's a, there's a whole bunch around the Boston box and lots of products span more than one box. Not, it's not always clear which box they go into and so lots of caveats around it. So I'm not give you a whole lecture on the Boston box. We'll, we'll talk in general terms of what it's trying to get to. What it's trying to say is you will have products in your organisation that live broadly in one of these boxes. So if we start at the top left there, you'll see that some things are stars. That should be clear from the axes that we're showing there. So you can see that the Y axis is market growth and the X axis is market share. So if you've got a product in a space where the market is growing, so there's high market growth and you've got lots of that market, 
so you get a high market share, well, that product's a star. Because all that's going to happen is a uh, market is going to grow. You're already big in that market space, so the chances are that your sales will grow. So that's a star product. As time goes on, markets can't grow all the time. At some point, they have to stabilise or even shrink. So as markets, as market growth decays, then you end up, if you still have a high market share, with something called a cash cow. So let me give you an example. When uh, computers moved, not all computers, when your basic office computer moved from a command line interface using something like DOS to a graphical interface using something like Windows, there was space to move into uh, creating new products. So in DOS, there was a, a word processor called WordStar, which was without doubt the preeminent word processor. When Windows became more popular, WordStar continued as a product. It also created its own Windows version, but there was space for others to move in, and lots did. WordPerfect was also in the top two of text-based word processors and also created uh, a Windows-based version Microsoft Word, I don't know if you know, but there was a, a text-based version of Microsoft Word. But it wasn't very successful. Hardly anybody used it. However, when the change was made to Windows, the Windows version of Word suddenly moved to the front. Not a surprise, it came from the same company. They had an idea of where Windows was going to be. They wanted to create products for it. There was a lot of money available to do that. So what you had was a product space where the market growth was massive because people were moving all their old command line interface computers over to the new graphical interface computers. And you had Word with a large market share with that because it came out of the traps very strongly and understood how to use Windows. So it was a star for Microsoft. Over the years, the growth in Windows slowed down and stalled. Because once you've moved to Windows, you've moved to Windows. You don't need another version. Microsoft will happily sell you Windows 3, 2000, NT, 7, 8, 10, and 11. But actually, the version of Word that you bought that would work on the first version of Windows will work on the latest version, assuming you've still got a 32-bit computer. So they were in a situation where the market growth was low because people weren't buying new versions of something. There wasn't a, a new version of Windows that they needed to move to that would need a new version of Word. On the other hand, they still had the highest uh, market share. So it became a cash cow for Microsoft. If you bought a Windows computer, chances were you wanted to buy Microsoft Office to go with it. So the money just kept rolling in. Yeah, there will be changes made, but again, I would bet my house on the fact that you could create the report that you're going to create for this module with the first version of Microsoft Word. No problem whatsoever. So it starts off a star, 
high market share in an area of high market growth moves into being a cash cow because it's still, if you think of a, a Windows Word processor, you think of what? So it's still the high market share, but because there's not as many new computers being bought, uh, there's low market share. So it continues bringing in money. You don't need to spend an awful lot on it. The cash will come in anyway. And it allows you to do other things. Of course, if the market share declines, if people don't use Windows anymore, if they decide that uh, uh, Mac OS or Linux is the way to go, then the product becomes what we call a dog. There's no market growth. They don't have much market share. So why are you in that market space? Why are you spending resources trying to um, support that product? So that's the general um, progress of any sort of product and it could be physical or it could be service based. In 1998 there was a massive market growth for software that would cope with the year 2000 problem. That market growth rather crashed after the year 2000. So these are natural cycles that come in. Now, I've missed one box, the problem child box, because that's the one, and as the name suggests, where it becomes an issue of what, what actually is this product? You've got a product that has the potential to be good. So you're in an area of high market growth, but you don't have a lot of that market. So if you're plans work, you can start to sell more, you can get higher market share and your product becomes a star. On the other hand, your low market share product could be stuck in a place where the market growth is low, so it becomes a dog. You can take all of the things that an organisation does, all of its products, real or virtual, and put them into one of these boxes to start thinking about how you um, should progress, to start thinking about plans. What are we going to do next month, next year, in the next 10 years? What business should we be in? That's strategy. And there are risks involved in those strategies, internal or external risks. Strategies can fail for all sorts of reasons. One of which is not being able to adapt. And I said at the start, you should continue to look at your strategy and figure out whether it's the right strategy for you. Does anyone know what this is. Looks like a strange combination of a projector and old computer. <laughs> and that is actually what it is. It was bits of an old projector. So anyone want to take a guess at what it does? Play slides. Play slides, projector. Any other guesses? Would it help if I told you the light's not coming out of that lens, it's going into that lens? Uh, so it's a new camera. Say that again. Oh, nothing so advanced as a video camera, but you're on the right lines.
It's the first digital still camera. Light came in the lens, was digitised with all those boards down there, and then saved. And now I'm going to feel old. Do you know what this is? Yeah, I don't think you could record anything but audio to cassette, the cassette tape. So but again, I suppose a video cassette was just the same, only larger. Yep. And of course, um, for those of us of a certain vintage uh, in home computers, one of the things you would do is connect a standard tape recorder to your computer and use it to store and load programs. Yeah, I can remember the old Spectrum cassette tapes. Yeah, exactly so it was a cassette tape to record the digitised picture. And do you want to take a guess at who invented this? Uh, Sony. Sony. It says digital on the side of the tape. Is it digital? That's a good guess. It wasn't. It's a good guess. Kodak. What was that? Kodak. Kodak. This was created by a company called Kodak in the sort of mid 70s ish. 75, I think. And for those of us of a certain age, we will remember Kodak because Kodak made cameras, the old style film camera. Not only did they make cameras, Kodak made the film that went in them. They made the chemicals that developed that film. They made the paper that you would print your pictures on and they made the chemicals that would develop the paper. They also had shops where you would take your film to get it developed and um, and grab your prints. So they made a wee bit from selling cameras, but they made an absolute bomb from selling film, paper and chemicals, as well as the, the processing part. And they would make Machines where you would stick your film in one side and your paper came out the other. So in 1975, the idea that you had a digital camera that saved data onto a tape and you looked at it on your computer was just, well, you know, well done, guys, but um, why bother? because they were making tons of money. I suppose it's a bit like Polaroid, how they had the camera and then you have to buy their pack of film for the, the camera. It is. It's very much that. And that's exactly what Kodak had with the non-instant uh, stuff. So you had to keep going back to them to buy new film and buy new paper and all that kind of stuff. So Kodak looked at it, patted the guy in the head and went, well done, now go back to the lab and do something that will make us some money. But of course, has anybody in this lecture still got a film camera? And even if you have, when was the last time you used it? Well, yep. I'm willing to bet everybody here has a digital camera and probably more than one, at least on your phone and possibly other places too. So Kodak took a strategic decision that no, they were quite happy with film and paper. And that even though they'd invented the digital camera, it wasn't worth pursuing with. 
And in doing so, they had a problem. Because you had a whole bunch of people who weren't making billions, and I mean billions, from the film and the paper. And they kind of thought, well, it's kind of hard to get into that, but it's a lot easier to get into the digital space. Maybe we should start creating digital cameras and do digital things. And of course they did. And of course they won. And sadly, Kodak went back bankrupt 10 years ago. Simply because their business became unviable. Nobody wanted to do that anymore. When was the last time you printed any of the pictures you took on your phone? And the point you made about recurring uh, sales for Polaroid is exactly the same point that a lot of the computer companies are looking at just now. I've made the point about Word, that one should bought Word. Why would you buy it again? Microsoft aren't daft, they understand that. So they are desperate for you not to buy Word now. What they really want you to do is buy a subscription to Office 365 at, I don't know, whatever it is, 60 quid a year. Now that may be less than what they'd make on a copy of Office, but that's 60 quid every year. And anybody who's ever had a, a an account that they can't cancel or a gym membership that's kept going long after they stop going to the gym or a magazine that comes through the door every month, even though they stop reading the magazine and they just pile up in the corner. will understand that once you've got somebody signed up to something, they tend to stay for a long time. Things like that. That. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, 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 I was just thinking it was like uh, sort of similar to how if you want to write any code for an Apple product, you need to do it on a Mac. Mm -hmm. Sort of tied into that, that ecosystem. And for a long time, Apple were absolutely slated for that strategic approach. And in fact, as you know, you can only get Macs via Apple. There was a time for three or four years where Apple allowed other companies to make Mac clones. But then they decided that they didn't like the quality and it didn't work as well. And they went the other way. They said, nope, we're going to keep this. We're going to keep it all in our own ecosystem so that we can be sure that things all work together. And it's a highly successful approach. Now, Apple stuff, as you all know, is more expensive. But if you buy into the Apple ecosystem, you tend to find that things just work. How many times have we been sitting in a lecture and I'm saying, I wonder what this machine's doing, or I wonder what this software's doing? Why is it not connecting properly? What's it up to? Many times have you connected a new device to your PC and it didn't want to work properly? I've got a printer at the moment that if I print a Word document, it prints perfectly, but if I print a PDF document, it puts lines all over it and it's driving me mad. Apple took the other approach and they said, no, it's coming from us. We will control every last aspect of it so that if we say it will work, it will work. And it's been hugely successful. And Apple, sort of, uh, they were the biggest company in the world. I think they've just moved into second place, but you know, I'll take second biggest company in the world for a company that could have gone bankrupt quite easily. They decided on the strategy and it was successful. Sorry, I cut across somebody again. Yeah, no, I'm just saying it's, it was a clever strategy because, I mean, as, as soon as you've got somebody using one product, then they're, they're then more than likely to buy into other products in that same ecosystem for that reason. I mean, it's, 
I can't really comment because I don't think I've ever used a, an Apple product in my life, but uh, yeah, it's definitely a, a clever business idea. And you're saying it's clever, but it's only clever because it worked. And there's a whole bunch yeah. of journalists who told Apple that it wouldn't work and a whole bunch of stockbrokers who sold Apple shares because they thought the company was going nowhere. If you'd bought Apple way back in the 80s, you wouldn't have to work again. But you would have gone through quite a few points where you thought you were going to lose all your money. So it's like any other strategy. You're a genius if it works and you're an idiot if it doesn't. The only thing you can do is decide on your strategy and go for it. Kodak decided on the strategy, they got it wrong. And as someone pointed out, this was a tape from a company called Digital Equipment Corporation. DEC also went the Apple route. You could buy DEC computers and DEC storage devices and DEC software, DEC everything. How many of you? Just give me a virtual thumbs up if you have. How many of you had heard of Digital Equipment Corporation before today? Um, one, two. DEC weren't quite so lucky. They lost. They took the same approach, but they lost. So you take your strategy, you do what you can. Um, Cameron's saying isn't most of the money made from patents. Um, patents are important. Um, particularly if you have a patent for something that makes a lot of money. But it may or may not make you money. You can approach patents in two, way, you, two ways. You can take out a patent and say, I am doing this nobody else is allowed to. Or you can take out a patent and say, I have figured out how to do this. Do you want to buy it off me? Um, there are risks and rewards in both approaches. And there are huge issues with patents, um, particularly in America, where patent law. The, in essence, there are so many patents coming in that the patent office can't keep up. So if you apply for a patent, um, you tend to get it because the patent office don't really look at what's going on. Which is a gold mine for lawyers, because what tends to happen is somebody's awarded a patent, somebody will then come along later and say, why were you awarded a patent for this? This is really obvious. People have been doing it for years. And then the lawyers will fight it out in courts. So patents are helpful, but it depends what the patent is and it depends whether you can defend it properly or not. OK, so that's the first heading, which is strategic risk. And I can't believe that that's been the best part of an hour. Um, so I think what we need, unless anyone disagrees, is a break. So shall we take a wee break and I will see you back here in 15 minutes. No worries. That's fine, thanks.
Okay, so we are back. Earlier on, we were talking about uh, types of risk that organizations can look at, the kind of general headings for them, rather than specific risks. And we got as far as strategic risk. Anybody get any questions or comments from that before we move on? No, I don't think so. I did see someone typing, but they've stopped now, so I don't know if they changed their mind. OK, if there are any questions, just check. OK, so after strategic in my list of types of risk, the next one we've got is compliance. <clears throat> are you working within the rules? Are you breaking any laws? Might you break any laws later? What happens if the laws change? Would that cause you a problem? Legislation changes all the time. And that issue is compounded where your organization works over multiple different regions, where there might be different laws around. Quite often, part of the GRC manager's job is to explain to people why they're having to um, do things in line with legislation that doesn't apply to them. And the reason for that is it's often easier for an organisation to comply with the strictest of legislation in all the areas where they are operating than it is to create different uh, frameworks in the different places. That's why you see lots of things about trade agreements and negotiations and what can and can't happen. So, for example, you may have seen stuff on the news about the prospect of selling chickens that have been washed in chlorine here in the UK. That used to be banned. And it was banned under an EU law. Now that we've left Europe, uh, the government are desperate to sign a trade deal with America in the hopes of replacing some of the 20% of trade that's been lost. Of course, America, knowing this, know that they have all the ACEs and can negotiate. And they can negotiate based on what they currently do. And because um, chickens are washed in chlorine as a matter of course in America, they would like to not change that. They would like to just be able to sell the chickens as they exist. So they're trying to get the UK to accept that if you wash a chicken in chlorine, you can sell it in the UK. Not surprisingly, lots of people aren't too happy about that. And you can look at lots of different areas where standards are being compromised, not because of health issues or anything else, but simply because of compliance issues. Does it make sense for the legislative framework where you are? And if not, can we get the legislative framework changed? Accounting rules are in the same way. We spoke before about some of the issues where uh, we've had problems with um, companies pushing accounting regulations right to the limits of what can happen and sometimes even further. And in some territories that has meant uh, the addition of new legislation to stop that happening. The Stieglitz laws in America, for example. Because that's an issue and because those laws have to be followed in America, quite often 
satellite versions of American companies will also follow those laws, again, to make sure that there's no issue, particularly for an American company, both where they're based and where they have a reputational issue, but also where they make most of their sales. So for a GRC person, it's not just about legislation here, it might be about legislation elsewhere as well. So it's about understanding regulations, understanding how they work, what you have to do to stay on the right side of them, and keeping a weather eye on the changes that might happen in the future. And most recently, GDPR was the big issue with that. You'll remember two years ago, the increasingly impassioned emails that you would get telling people that if they, if you didn't write to them immediately, then they would be forced to stop sending you emails to which most of us said, hurry. It can be an issue and it can be an issue for all types of organisation. The example I have is a GDPR one. So three years ago, a really large organisation was found to be non-compliant. What it had done, because it's a really large organisation and got lots of phone calls, it had recorded the calls and in the same way as one of your home devices can recognise your voice, they decided to create biometric voice print IDs from the phone calls. The idea being that the next time you phoned up, they would recognise your voice and whoever was on the other end of the line would have access to your account immediately which seems like a good idea and it speeds everything up. Except, of course, they didn't comply with the law. They didn't actually ask anyone if they were OK with being recorded. They didn't ask anyone if they were OK with their biometric data being stored. They didn't ask anyone if they were OK with that biometric data being matched. So eventually the organisation was forced to not just remove the process, they were forced to delete all the data that they'd stored. And you might think, well, yeah, OK, that happens. Organisations get it wrong. People can not fully understand what the issues are. And that is true. But this wasn't exactly a fly-by-night organisation. It was Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. The tax man had broken the GDPR laws. And I think the point I'm making is, if an organisation that large can fail to comply with legislation that probably more than anything else impinged itself into the public consciousness simply because of all the things that had to be done to comply with it. If an organisation like that can have problems, what's a small organisation going to be like? Any questions about that one? OK, in that case, we'll move on to our next heading of operational risk. Every organisation has to continue to do business, whatever that business is and whether it's a business or not. It has to do what it was set up to do. So you need to, <coughs> excuse me, examine the processes that are happening and try and identify where any risks may lie with those processes. And the example I've given there is one that follows on from, from our very first lecture. What happens if, as part of your accounting team, you give the uh, rights to the accounting system to one person with no checks? What if that one person receives an invoice from their brother-in-law, 
for a thousand pounds. And instead of paying the thousand pound invoice, pays them a hundred thousand pounds. And that extra 99,000 is split between them. Who checks that? Who makes sure that doesn't happen? In fact, why would they even send an invoice for a thousand pounds? Why didn't they sell, send the invoice for 100,000 so that the accounts match? Who checked that the £100,000 invoice was correct and was reasonable and for our services rendered? And you might think, £100,000, surely somebody will notice. And you would hope so. But the question is, at what point would people notice? And again, we, we saw that a couple of weeks ago where we looked at um, how we devolved decisions. And we talked about the limits that you would have at a particular level in an organisation. So for some organisations, £100,000 isn't really that much. Not if your turnover can be measured in the billions of pounds. And because you guys are cyber security, what happens about other operational issues? What happens if somebody hacks your server? What if your server goes down? What does that do to your organisation? What happens if somebody doesn't hack your server and it just fails anyway? And you point to the document saying 99% uptime, and that's what we've reached. Before someone gently points out to you that the organisation runs 365 days a year. So 99% uptime means that almost four days a year you don't have a server. That's a risk. So in your risk register, you'd say the server might go down. That would cause an issue. And you'd detail what those issues were. And you'd say what kind of mitigation can be taken. And that may or may not be accepted. Some organisations might say four days out of a year, that's fine. If the mitigation is that to stop it, you'd have to buy another server at the cost of £20,000 and have it sitting there. They might take the four day downtime rather than the £20,000 hit. The nice thing is that's not really your problem. You have identified the risk. You have identified the issues that would occur from the risk. You have identified steps that could be taken to mitigate that risk. You've put them all on a risk register and you've left it up to someone else to decide. That's where the governance comes in. And of course, for an example of that, there was just there's just too many. At least every week you'll see a, a report of Gmail going down or Facebook being unavailable or you can't send a message on WhatsApp or um, Office 365 not being available. Last week, Sky Broadband went down and I didn't have any internet access. I wasn't too happy. This happens all the time. Most recently, or not most recently, but one that's close to home, there's something called the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, SEPA. SEPA's servers were hacked. Four thousand digital files stolen. And SEPA now have to build a new IT system from scratch. Hopefully that was on the cybersecurity people's risk register. Because it's cost them a million pounds and rising. 
because this is a wee bit out of date now. And I'm pretty sure that the danger of cyber attack is on everybody's risk register these days. If not, somebody's doing a really bad job. Is the prospect that whoever the hackers were would also have a second hack to try and stop you fixing the problem? Whose risk register is that on? Their cyber incident response plan was inaccessible during the incident. Why? Because they stored it on the servers that had been hacked. Didn't keep a copy anywhere. Wasn't Sorry. offline, hadn't printed it off. What was that gun? Oh, it's just you saying that. I seen a, an article a wee while ago and it was a sheriff department in America somewhere. So they get hit with a ransomware attack, everything locked. They paid the ransom to get the files back. And I think it was something like two days later. Uh, somebody done the same thing and they got their files encrypted with the same ransomware again mm. two days after paying the ransom so there's clearly something going wrong there absolutely they probably thought that um, the hackers were, were all from the same company and once they've been hacked once they wouldn't do it again but of course you can get toolkits available online and anybody with an internet connection having read that the server is vulnerable, can go, oh, I wonder if, and just go back again. Yep, ransomware as a service, and Cameron's put that in, I think, is partly as a wee joke, but it's not far away. So, as I haven't heard it actually used as that take, I haven't heard it used as a term before. I'll need to remember that one. Cameron says it is actually called that. So that's just a couple of examples of organisational risk, and I'm sure you can think of lots more. One, not surprisingly, is financial risk. Hmm. I just pause there because Cameron's put a link to uh, a post where someone has coined the phrase. And it's a decent phrase, might even catch on. Uh, next one is financial risk. All organisations need money because money comes in, money goes out all the time for staff, for premises, for services, for products, for whatever it's going to be. And that shows uh, changes throughout the year. Christmas card manufacturers struggle at other times of the year. So they move into making birthday cards or Easter cards or Mother's Day cards or Father's Day cards or any other thing that they can make up. Similarly, the people that make Christmas puddings. When was the last time you saw a Christmas pudding on sale outside November to January? So they go and make other things. They make sticky toffee puddings or whatever else they would do. So cash changes, it changes throughout the year and you have a, a variation. So organisations have to keep money on hand. And again, if you think back to a couple of weeks ago, I did show you that on some of the documents, that it was shown as a risk and that one of the mitigations was to have enough cash on hand in order to ensure that people could be paid and all the rest of it for a reasonable time. Because if the amount gets too large, it can be an issue. And again, it was probably one of the first things we spoke about as an example in this course. There's some examples on screen there 
of what can happen, how it can happen, and all these things can cause a risk for the organisation. It could be a small risk that they lose money, it could be a bigger risk that they continually lose money that causes their business model into doubt, or it can be a massive risk where they simply don't have the cash anymore. An example of that is a, a place called Penny's Seafood Processors. If you're ever in a, a shop and you're in the freezer section and you see one with the brand name Young's, that's Penny's Seafood Processors. And they had a massive factory in uh, Dumfries and Galloway. I think it was in Stranraa from memory, but it could have been Dumfries. Dumfries and Galloway, anyway. What they'd done was they'd got orders, as businesses need to do. They had got orders from people who wanted to buy their products and their seafood processors, so it was prawns and salmon and stuff. And one of their customers was Marks and Spencer. Now, it so happened that the cost of seafood, the raw materials, increased quite a lot, 25%. Now, that's a lot of money. And they wanted to renegotiate contracts. So the contract was up, they wanted to do a new one. They said, OK, well, raw materials have gone up, therefore we're going to have to charge you more. And Marks and Spencer said, uh, We'll keep going if you can give us the same price, but other than that, no. So pennies were faced with a choice. They had a contract to supply seafood, but it cost them more to supply it than they were bringing in. So they simply said, can't do it. Give up the contract and 577 people were made redundant. Because the organisation was too reliant on one revenue stream. If they'd had contracts with lots of other companies and it was only part of their company, then they may have been fine. But if you're only doing work for one other organisation, and that work then becomes I was about to say not profitable, but it wasn't even breaking even. Then what can you do? And nearly 600 people lost their jobs as a result. Finance makes and breaks organisations. OK, the final one I want to talk about, final heading is reputational risk. And this is one actually where becoming even more aware of. Some organisations are so aware of it that they're doing their best to try and make it seem as if people are being unreasonable. A reputational risk is where an organisation does something and people decide, no, we're not happy. An organisation decides to put in rules that say that people can't meet, but then decides to break those rules itself. There's a problem then with the reputation of the organisation that breaks those rules. And the defenders then say, oh, it's not really a problem. You're just trying to cancel them. This cancel culture's got out of hand. There's a... 24 hour channel called GB News, set up by offshore money to push a far right agenda in the guise of a news channel. And what people do quite regularly is they take note of who advertises on that channel and they post it to social media, Twitter and Facebook, and say, by the way, if you buy from X, 
you are indirectly funding Y. And of course, the people that run those kind of organisations go, oh, you're just trying to cancel us. How dare you boycott us? But of course, people have always boycotted things. The difference is people can organise now. The difference is people can see what other people are doing and the boycotts become bigger and more organised. And that's an issue for organisations, which is why they try and reframe it. It's why they try and say, oh, it's not about us. This is just about people on the right or the left, you know, decide which side you don't like. This is about people on the right or the left just trying to cancel people they don't agree with. It's not about cancelling, it's about saying we don't agree with you and we're going to voice that disagreement and use every power that we have to ensure that that disagreement has an effect. When distillers created and distributed thalidomide, which caused birth defects. People complained. Not surprisingly. Distillers didn't turn up and go, oh, you're just trying to cancel us. How dare you? In trying to turn around the, the narrative, they can actually make it worse. So organisations can have issues with their reputations. Some of them don't care. Um, if you are a big chemical company, Chemco, and I should pause at this point to say I have no idea there's a company called Chemco, and if there is, I'm not talking about you, I promise, please don't sue me. If you're a company called Chemco and you sell bulk chemicals to other companies and you find out that Chemco has been releasing um, toxins into a river, once again, I don't know if Chemco exists, and if they do, I'm sure that they didn't do this. If you find out that they've been releasing toxins into the river, you might decide that you want to speak up about that and say, oh, Chemco are awful. We shouldn't deal with them. But actually, the kind of people that would support that, you know, by deciding not to buy a Chemco shampoo or a Chemco soap, don't actually have that opportunity because they make bulk chemicals which go to other companies to make their products. So things like that tend to just fade. On the other hand, companies with a, who are well known, who are household names, who people can directly affect, that then becomes an issue. If the organisation does something that causes a poor outcome, it can have huge knock-ons. People might boycott you so you don't have as much money. If you've done something bad, well, it tends, tends not to be everybody in the company. So staff that belong to that organisation are tend to get upset. Why are we doing this? I didn't realise that that's the kind of company I worked for. And that can then cause a vicious cycle. Staff get upset. That means that you don't uh, get the best from them. Organisations decide not to buy from you, so your money goes down, so you have to get rid of people, which causes reputational risk, and it can be a big, big issue. And again, I, I direct you to the stuff that we were talking about uh, a few weeks ago, when we talked about um, auditors going out of business because they didn't actually audit properly. And the blowback from that was so much that people refused to use them anymore. If you're an accounting firm that does auditing and you have just been found guilty of not actually auditing, but signing off the audit just to get the contract, no other company can credibly hire you. Because everyone's going to say, oh, yes, you've used the same company. Therefore, your books are suspect as well. So this can cause a cascade effect and people can 
um, lose jobs, companies can go to the wall. So it can be a big, big issue. Let me give you an example. Say you are a company who um, who buy things. You buy things from other companies. And say you negotiate contracts to buy those things. And the raw materials to create those things become more expensive. And instead of accepting that they become more expensive and renegotiating a contract, you allow your supplier to go bust and make 577 people redundant. You may have heard of this example. It wasn't just pennies that lost out, or they clearly lost out the most, although not as much as their employees. m and has lost out as well because there was a huge reputational blowback. How could there be otherwise? People that go to m and have a certain... They think of themselves in a particular way. It wouldn't occur to them that they would support people who would act like this. Who would try and buy things at less than they actually cost to make. So they made their feelings very clear. And once again, the kind of people that shop in m and are the kind of people who can make their voices very clear. So those are the five general headings that I've come up with. And as I say, they are not complete. They are not prescriptive. They are just um, common to all organisations. Does anyone have any questions or comments about those before we move on? Nothing that I can think of just now. Uh, nothing here, thanks. Okay. In that case, um, what you're going to do as part of the tutorial is, not surprisingly, start to think about examples of these risks, specifically under those categories, but also any other categories that you can come up with. So you need to think about the risk, think about what the issue is, what the outcome might be, what it would cost the organisation, either financially or in other ways, and how you may approach it. If there are no questions, then I will stop the recording. And once again, this will be available on the YouTube channel soon.